In Jesus' name we pray. Almighty God, we thank you for this session we're getting to of Bible teaching. Lord, we pray you help us to look away from the vessel of clay and look directly unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Help us, Lord, to forget everything in the past, everything around us, everything in our thoughts, everything suggested by anyone or anything. And just look straight to the future and have the end in mind as we look at the pages of the scriptures today that Lord, the benefit that you are provided for, what eyes have not seen, what ears have not heard, what has not entered into the hearts of men, the things you prepared for the people that love, for the people that fear, for the people that worship, for the people that adore, for the people that follow you. Those things were prepared for us, that they will be ours. Help us, Lord, to look beyond the present and look to the very future so that we'll not miss that final goal of the believers in Jesus' name. We're praying, O oh Lord, that our coming here will not just to come, will not be to come as usual for just a convention, for just a congress. But Lord, through this, you'll prepare us. For that final day. And then you'll prepare us to be used as instruments. To prepare other people for the final day. In Jesus name. Lord help us to forget what we like. What we don't like. What we want. What we don't want. Who we accept. Who we don't accept. Lord whoever you want to use. If you want to use anyone. To speak your word, that's your choice. And Lord, we pray, it will not be the way we wish, but thy will be done. And if it's your will, to use another vessel and just give us the word. All we need is your word. You use this worthless, useless clay standing here. Or you use another person sitting down there. You use a man, you use a woman, you use a child, you use a man, you use an intelligent person, you use an unintelligent, incoherent person. What do we care for? All that we care for is to get to heaven. And whatever it will take, Lord, whatever it will take, whoever you will use, whatever verse of scripture you will use, whatever message you will use, a five minute message, a two hour message, what does it matter? Lord, when we cross that line, when we go beyond River Jordan, when we see all the days of temptation, all the days of trials past, when we cross over to the other side, and we see those myriads and myriads and myriads of angels, and we, useless people, worthless people, unqualified people, will stand in the same place where Abraham is standing. We, that are not consecrated, not committed, the living and standing where David, and where Isaiah, and where Jeremiah, and where the prophets of old, and the people that died for the faith, where they are standing. Lord, who are we? That will ever expect that we get to the same heaven that Stephen got to, who was martyred for the faith. What have we suffered? What cross have we borne? What have we carried? What service have we rendered that we will ever be able to get to that place? Lord, if we get there on that final day and we can be in that same place where the worthies of old have been, Lord, that's all we want. That's all we want. Whoever you use, whatever word it is, it will not matter. Lord, what do you do for me? Drag me, flog me, knock me, buffet me, crush me. Lord, go ahead. All I want is just take me to heaven eventually. If you need to destroy this body, you need to destroy my confidence in the flesh, you need to destroy anything, drag me until I get over there. Go ahead. That's all I want. Lord, we pray that whatever it will take for us to get into those pearly gates, 
Start this morning. Accomplish it in our lives. Do it for us in Jesus' name. Lord, or oh, how I wish, oh Lord, that you have another servant, another preacher, another person to stand in here today and preach this indestructible word. For me to sit down and hear your own servant more qualified to talk on this. Lord, but we cannot argue with you. You choose and you use whoever you want. Therefore, Lord, make me to forget my own words. Amen. Let me just give your word as it is. If five minutes is what all you give me to talk. Lord, thank you, Jesus. If it's five hours, give me the strength. Speak to your people today. In Jesus' name we pray. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 5. I'm looking at verses 25, 26, and 27. We're talking about this subject, holiness and sanctification through Christ. Holiness and sanctification through Christ. The subject of sanctification, which merges... Well, the subject of holiness, those things are preserved and presented to us as important, as indispensable in the scriptures. In a passage I'm going to read to you, you'll find the word sanctify. You'll find the word cleanse. You'll find the word holy. You'll find the word without blemish. You'll find the word without stain, without spot, without any wrinkle. In the passage I'm going to read to you, you'll find Christ presented as a sanctifier. You'll find Christ as the focus of the attention of the apostle, of the epistle, of the believers, of the children of God. If they are going to eventually get to heaven. And in the passage I'm going to read to you, you'll find that Christ loved the church so much that he had to give is very life and shed is very blood so that this important non-negotiable indispensable thing will be yours and mine and then you will find that the world is not even here in this passage the world is over there in john chapter 3 for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. As we talk about salvation, and we talk to the people outside there in the world, then the people that believe, they come in into the kingdom, and temporarily, the Lord shuts the door. And then the people that are inside now are the people that are born again. The people that are cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. The people whose names are written in the book of life. The people, everything has changed for them. If any man be in Christ, is a new creature. All things are passed away and behold, all things are become new. They are the people as beloved children. As children, not fashioning themselves according to their former laws in their ignorance. They are the people that are now around Christ. And then Christ said, I gave myself so that the world will be saved. But you people here inside the kingdom you people who have entered through the door and you didn't enter through the window because anyone that does not enter through the door is a thief and is a robber but then you have entered through the door and you are now in the closet with your lord you have accepted him as your savior and as your lord do you think i gave myself only for the people that are out there so that they will be saved he tells us he gave himself unto the church for the church, for the sake of the church, that he might cleanse and sanctify it, and that he might make it holy without blemish, and that it might present it to himself. Glorious church. Church. What is church? Church is not a club. What is church? Church is not a society. What is church? Church is not an ordinary religious assembly. What is church? Church is not just a gathering of retreat people, of congress people. Church, what is church? Church is not a congregation of Bible carriers. What is church? Church is not a company of Pharisees who take the external part of the world and they neglect the inward part of the world. 
what is church? Church is not a company of people that run around and they're looking for miracles and healings. We have heard he turned water into wine. We have heard that he gave them bread to eat. And then Jesus turned them away. He said, you come, not because you have seen the miracles, but because you have fed. Labor not for that which perisheth, but labor for that which endures unto life eternal. What is church? The church is a company of people, a gathering of people. The people who came because they were convicted of their sins. And then they bent down at the cross. If you ever see the cross, if you ever understand the cross, if you ever come before the cross, there is something that automatically that the cross will do for you. The cross will so crush your life that you'll bend down at the foot of the cross. You just crumble when you get to the cross. There are the people that have been to the cross and they crumbled and they bent down and they bent low. And it was at that point where the cross crushed their will, where the cross crushed their personality. Where the cross crushed everything within them that was rising against the lordship of the Lord. What is church? The company of people that visited the cross. The company of people that have been transformed by the cross. The company of people that their sins are washed away. Their sins are taken away. And their sins are totally cleansed. And blessed is the man unto whom the Lord will not impute iniquity. Blessed is the man. His iniquities are covered. It says, I blotted out. I blotted out. Even your transgression as a sea cloud. What is church? The people that are saved. And he added, the Lord added to the church. Such as should be saved. The people that are saved. The people whose names are written in the book of life. Rejoice not. Because the spirits are subject unto you. But rejoice because your names are written in heaven. What is church? Not the people that register there. What is church? Not the people that are seated here. What is church? Not the people that wear the kinds of clothes we wear. What is church? Not the people that are preaching. The people whose names are written in heaven. What is church? Take it unto yourselves and to all the flock. Over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers, the church of the living God, purchased by the blood of the Son of God. The people who are purchased, the people that uh, they, they have seen the price of Calvary. And that price of Calvary has been effective in their lives. They are saved. They are bought. They are the redeemed of the Lord. They have a name in heaven. And the Lord knows that they are living. What is church? The people that have come into Christ. And Christ has come into them. And your life is seed with Christ in God. The people, they set their affections on things on high. And not on the things below. What is church? The people that are the disciples of the Lord. They follow him everywhere that he goes. And no matter in the day or in the night. They are the people that say... They have declared for the Lord and they are following the Lord and they are following the way of the Lord and the way of the world, they will not follow. What is church? The people that love not the world. None of the things that are in the world. Because if any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. All things that are in the world, the pride of life, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes. They are not of the Father, but they are the world. And the world passes away and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of the Lord, that's the church, the company of people that do the will of the Lord. They have been separated from the world. They have been called out of the world. And they have given themselves totally to the Lord. That's the church. And even though they have been selected, they have been chosen, and they have been taken away from the world, Jesus said, that's not enough. He said, church, I gave myself for you, that you might be sanctified by the cleansing of water by the word. The word, the word, that word has an important part to play. What word? Number one, the personified word. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. That word personified has something to do with self sanctification. Number two, the written word. This word in the Bible. This word in the word of God. In the, in the holy reach. That when you read it. When you meditate on it. And when you allow it to come into you. 
to chisel something out of your life and to crush you and to burn you like fire and to, and to pierce you like a sword. This reaching word, it has something to do with your sanctification. Number three, the spoken word. Ye are clean through the word which has spoken unto you. Show me a man who wants to be sanctified. He has the, 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 the word personified. He has the word that is written. And then he does not joke. He does not play with the spoken word. The word comes to you. And when it comes to you, it may come like rain. It may come like dew. It may come like fire. It may come like hammer. It may come like a piercing sword. It may come like water to cleanse. Whichever way it comes, you accept that word. And that is the word that cleanses and purifies and sanctifies. Look at the passage. Ephesians chapter 5. Reading from verse 25. Osmans. Love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and he gave himself for it. This sanctification must be important. If Christ so loved the church, and he said, that there is nothing else I can do, I'll give myself for the church. Then it says in verse 26, that he might sanctify. He, it's, he is a sanctifier, he is a savior. He is a sanctifier and is a baptizer in the Holy Ghost that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the world. Cleanse it, cleanse it, cleanse it. He knows where to, he knows where to cleanse. You don't know. He knows where to cleanse. Your brain needs cleansing. Your heart needs cleansing. Your spirit needs cleansing. Even your flesh, the filthiness of the flesh, needs cleansing. Everything about you, within and around, your disposition, everything needs cleansing. Do you understand? Even after you are saved, even after you are born again, there are some things you do habitually. That even when you do not intend to do those things, it's like a reflex action. You just do them. You just do them. You just do them. It is after doing them, you'll say, why did I do that? What did I promise the Lord at the end of last year? Didn't I cry? Didn't I tell the Lord? Didn't even have vow to the Lord? Lord, never again. Why did I do that again? Your, your habit needs cleansing that he might sanctify and cleanse it or the washing of water by the word. And then it says that it, he might present it to himself. That he might present it to himself. A glorious church. Why? Many of you here, how many of you are married? Can you rise up? Can, sorry, don't rise up. Can you raise up your hand? You are married? God will bless you and bless your wife and your husband. You know, in marriage, when you dream of that day, the wedding day, and then you look at your wife, your wife to be, and the kind of clothes she will wear, you want to have the joy, the satisfaction, the contentment that on that day, she will be the queen of the occasion. The most beautiful in that occasion. And the most pleasing in that occasion. And whatever pleases you is what you want her to wear. The Lord is thinking of the marriage supper of the Lamb. When his bride, the church, when that bride will be taken, will have passed through a lot of experiences and a lot of things, and that bride will be presented unto Christ. And Christ is thinking of that time when his bride only dressed in white linen. For the white linen is the righteousness of the saints. And then will present that church unto himself. A glorious church. Not having sport. Any sport in any area of your life. You don't know. In that spot at the back of your head, you've never seen it, it's there. You don't know that spot at your back, you don't see it. And all the, all the bathroom that you've gone into, and all the washing that you have done, you don't see that. Even the one under the sole of your foot, that spot, that stain there, that mark, you don't see it. And even when the photographer takes your picture, you don't see that either. It is when maybe you are married and then your wife uh, might say, what is this thing at your back? You say, what is that? And then he arranges, she arranges the mirror and then puts one here, puts one there and says, hey, try to look at this. You say, what? Since I was born, I didn't know that standard spot was there. That's it. There is a spot in your heart. There is a stain in your heart. There is a stain that Almighty God can see, which you have not seen. 
That's why you are going about. I'm born again. I'm saved. Praise the Lord. Everything is all right. And Almighty God says, I see you more than you see yourself. I see you through and through. I see your mind. I see your heart. I see your spirit. I see your emotion. I see your intention. I see your motive. I see you. I see you from the, from the past. I see your present. I see your, I, I see your future. I see your leaning. I see your tendencies. I see everything. There is a spot there. Give me chance today. I want to cleanse you from that spot. I want to cleanse you from that stain. It says that he might present you to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Holy and without blemish. Holy and without blemish. Almighty God, do this for us. If there is no other thing, if there is no other thing, that we come together here, if God doesn't do any other thing for us and he just takes my sister there and he takes my brother there and you don't struggle with God, you leave yourself in the hand of God and then he scrubs you and it washes, sometimes it's painful, sometimes it's painful. I have a, a particular heel sore in my leg. It's healed now. And every time, every time I see the mark there, I see the scar there. And every time I see that, I, I, I remember, I remember more than 40, 50 years ago when my father will take the sponge. He said he was helping me and scrub that thing. I'll be crying, I'll be crying and he scrub that thing. And then at that time, what they need to do is to to pour iodine on it and then he will pour it on it and the thing will almost send me to a place you don't want to go it's like you, you cry you don't know how to cry you scream you don't know how to scream the thing hurts but my father was trying to heal that thing and the lord when he comes into your life and he sees that stain and he sees that blemish and he says this one will not go out by gentle persuasion this one will not go out by a kind of gentle cleansing with a kind of sponge that doesn't scratch anybody. You need something, the sponge of heaven. May the Lord do it today. I said, may the Lord do it today. And even if it pains you, even if it scratches you, even if it crushes you, no matter what will happen, once I, I don't feel the pains anymore now. That saw is healed now. Everything is all right now. And I go about now. All I have now is just the remembrance of the pain my daddy caused me. When he scrubbed that thing, it, the pain will not remain forever. If you will allow the Lord today and just bring your heart and just bring your soul and just say, Lord, I want you to cleanse me. I want you to uh, wash everything until I am clean. Until I am clean. Until I'm pure. And then there is no spot. There is no stain that remains. That's what he wants to do. And then, when he has done that, and he has prepared you for heaven, we don't know when the Lord will come. If the Lord sanctifies us, and then he washes us, and he looks at us, and he's not only looking at the preacher, he's not only looking at a few members of the church, he looks at all of us here. And then he looks at the church there, and he says, Father, isn't this the best time that these people now are sanctified? Without blemish? Without spot? Will they ever be more glorious than this? Is this not the best time to take them home? And Heavenly Father said, yes, the time is all. And a trumpet sounds. The dream of the ages. The desire of the ages. What you dreamt about. What you wondered. Will it ever be possible? When you read the Bible, when you look at Psalm 24, when you look at Psalm 15, when you look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, and you look at your life, and you say, Lord, Can I ever make it? If the standard is so high like this. If you will not change the standard for anybody. And I look at my life. And I look at my actions. And I look at my thoughts. And I compare myself with Paul. With Stephen. 
while they were stoning him. Lord, they have not stoned me. They have not stoned you. You got angry. They have not killed you. You fought back. When I look at my life, and I stand before Stephen, and I say, Lord, are these the only people that will get to heaven? And God says, yes. I change not. And then I wonder at all the many, many, many congresses and retreats. Lord, will I make it? When eventually the cleansing, sanctifying blood of Jesus comes in your heart, comes in your soul, finally, because with God, all things are possible. With men, Michael. With men, Joseph. With women, Mary there. With women, Rebecca there. This is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. When eventually, Almighty God comes in and he sanctifies you and he sanctifies me. And he sanctifies him. And he sanctifies her. And then God says, the time is over. And then, the trumpet sounds. And the dead in Christ are raised. And we, of all people, as weak as we are, as uncooperative as we are, as ununderstanding as we are, we that remain, we are caught up together with them. When I see myself like this, <laughs> going up, no more temptation, no more trial, no more sickness, no more. Can Satan tempt you to do anything? When that day comes, oh, it will come. It will come. When that day comes, and you come up like this, and you're going up, and you look down below, and you see your colleagues, you see the people that are faster than you are, the people that are more eloquent than you are, the people that got saved even before you got saved, the people that preach better messages than you preach, you see them down below, and you see yourself going up, going up, and then you get there eventually, and you cross over forever and ever. And ever. You are there with the Lord. You say, Lord, I didn't know I will make it. But grace has overcome the rottenness and the corruption of my life. That's what the Lord wants to do. He can do it. I said he can do it. I said he can do it. If there is any miracle I'm looking for. If there is any supernatural thing I'm looking for, it's a miracle, the supernatural thing, that today, Almighty God himself will come. And that he will do it himself. And I don't care how he does it. I don't care what time it takes him to do it, that he will come. And then, whatever is still in this heart of mine, I don't know whether anything is there. I, I've been quoting date. 17th of November 1965, I was sanctified. That's date. But if the Lord can just come today and just reach down deep into my heart, whatever is there, whatever is there, beyond preaching, beyond coaching date, beyond writing anything in the form, before giving a testimony to anybody, if there is anything still there, if the Lord himself, by his mighty power, if he will reach down deep into me, if you'll do that thing. And then, he makes your heart, he makes your soul, he makes everything to be like Christ alone. He will do it. He wants to do it. And if you will allow him, he will do it in your life. That he might present it to himself. The, the church is too much worried. About being presented to the media. Being presented to the world. The world is too much worried. 
about what the worldly people, what the council of churches, what other denominations, what they say about us. And the church is too careful. Let's do it this way. Let's do it this way so that we can be presented unto the world. That's not important in the sight of the Lord. That he might present it unto himself. A glorious church. What makes a church glorious? A big auditorium? Nothing. What makes a church glorious? Good music? Nothing. Go to those people of the world who are not even born again and listen to music, music, singing. And you know there's music in the world. That doesn't make the church glorious. What makes the church glorious? Administration, organization, nothing in the sight of God. What makes the church glorious? That you have qualified, capable preachers that understand the mysteries of the kingdom. That's nothing. Sanctification. Holiness. That it might present you to himself a glorious church. Not having spot. Not having wrinkle. Or any such thing. But that it should be holy and without blemish. That's what makes a church glorious. And any church, any church that relegates the teaching and the experience and the lifestyle of sanctification and holiness to the background is no more a glorious church. I don't care what testimonies come out of that church if there is no sanctification experience and the sanctification lifestyle in that church, the church is not glorious. This is the one single thing that makes a church glorious that the members and the ministers, the preachers and the people they are preaching to, they allow the power of the Lord, the cleansing of the Lord to come upon them, sanctify them, purify them, present to the Lord. And then the Lord approves of that church and he says, that's all right, that's all right. You are holy, you are righteous, and he backs up your testimony and he can see through and through. That's what makes a church glorious. You know you are looking for points one, two, and three, or four, or five. It's not the point that matters. What matters is that this sin in us, the Lord will take it away. Whatever will not make us glorious, a glorious Christian, in a glorious church, that the Lord will take that sin away. You want points? Number one then. Sanctification for the church. Sanctification for the church. This is not for the world. This is for the church. If you look at First Thessalonians, already you've seen it in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 5, and it tells you there in Ephesians chapter 5 that the Lord Jesus, he gave himself for the church so that he will sanctify and cleanse it. Therefore, you know that this sanctification is for the church in First Thessalonians. In First Thessalonians, Paul the Apostle tells us about the church in Thessalonica. And this church in Thessalonica, he tells us Paul and Silvanus in verse 1, chapter 1, and Timotheus, unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father. And in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father. And the Lord Jesus Christ, in verse 3, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, and your labor of love. And it says, even your patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father. Obviously, this is church. This is church. They were born again. And then they had love, and they had faith, and they had hope. It tells us in verse 6, and ye became followers of us and of the Lord. They were followers of the Lord. Talk about, I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Talk about the world behind me and the cross behind me. No turning back. No turning back. Talk about though all oppose me, still I will follow. No turning back. No turning back. These people, ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction and with joy of the Holy Ghost. 
so that ye were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. They believe the Lord. Not only that, they were living exemplary lives to the people in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord. Not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God is uh, spread abroad so that we have need of, we have need not to speak anything. You will see there that those people, they were born again. That's church. And then it tells us in verse 9, For they themselves show us what manner of entering in we had unto you. How that ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and the true God. That's church. They are turned away from idols. Those dead, dumb idols. They are turned away from them. And they were serving the true and the living God. And to wait for his son from heaven. Uh, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from wrath to come. In chapter 2, verse 13. For this cause also, thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. They were, they were saved. That's church. And yet, do, do you see that Paul the apostle did not trust in the fact that they were saved. He wanted them to go ahead and to be sanctified. In chapter 5, verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you holy. The very God of peace sanctify you holy. Entirely and completely. There is, a, there is initial kind of um, semblance of sanctification. When you are saved, the Lord cleanses your life and outwardly you are set apart, you are sanctified, you are made holy. And the things you used to do, and the places you used to go, and the things you used to delight in, you don't go there anymore, you don't delight in them anymore, you don't do them anymore. And there is a semblance of sanctification in that initial experience of salvation. But then it says that the very God of peace will sanctify you completely, entirely, holy. There is still something waiting. Although these Thessalonians were saved, although these Thessalonians, they were the church of the redeemed. That is, they were redeemed of the Lord. And yet it says that he'll sanctify you completely. And I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Can he do that? I said, can he do that? Hey, you know, there are many people that believe that God can even raise the dead. He can cleanse the leper. He can break the yoke. He can give you a breakthrough. He can give children to the bind. He can do every other thing except to sanctify and make holy through and through until there is no sin, inbred sin, inward sin, Adamic nature. They don't believe that God can do that. All they believe is that God can do some supernatural things externally, outwardly. But here he tells us in verse 24, Faithfully see that call at you who also will do it. Faithfully see that call at you who also will do it. Oh yes, he can. And in fact, he wants to do it. Have you checked up your Bible lately? Now when God talks about holiness, he talks to his own children. When God talks about sanctification, he talks to his own children to tell you that sanctification is for the church. What did he say in Leviticus chapter 11 verse 44? I am the Lord your God. Ye shall be holy, for I am holy. Leviticus 20 verses 7 and 8. Be ye holy, for I am holy. I, the Lord your God, I am holy. And then he says, I am the Lord which sanctify you. In Leviticus 11 verse 45, it says, I am the Lord that bringeth you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. Ye shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. And he tells them, Leviticus 19, in verse 2, speak unto all the congregation, all the congregation, not only Aaron, not only the Levites, not only the special people, speak unto all the congregation and say unto them, ye shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. In the New Testament, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all the filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. 
I about Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4. It says he has chosen us in him. That we should be holy and without blame before him. In Colossians chapter 1 verses 21 and 22. You are seen now reconciled. So that he can present you holy, unblameable, unreprovable in his sight, in his sight. And then in First Peter chapter 1 verses 15 and 16. As he which has called you is holy. So, be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, I am holy. So, be ye holy. So then you see, the call that we should be holy, the call that we should be sanctified, is to the church. He even says a new heart also, will I give you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. I will give you an heart of flesh. And then we are told that the Father, in correcting us, in rebuking us, in chastising us, it does that for our profit. It chastises us that we may partake us of his holiness. Will you ever forget Jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood? He suffered without the gate. That means then that sanctification is for the church. Is for the people of God. Is for those who have come to the Lord. For the people that have known God already. And it is when you have the mind of Christ. You have the desires of Christ. And you have the aspirations of Christ. And you have the ambition of Christ. And your ambition is not ambition for mundane things. Ambition for position. Ambition for um, being lifted, exalted high in the things of the world or even in the things of the church. And there are some people, the only ambition they have, they are ambitions that will not take us to heaven. Ambition to be a bishop, you can be a bishop and lose heaven and miss heaven. Ambition to be a preacher, ambition to be a missionary, ambition to be a miracle worker, ambition to have faith to move mountains, ambition so that you can speak in tongues of angels and of men, ambition so that you'll know the depths of the mysteries of the kingdom. All those things you can have if you do not have this holiness, if you do not have this surpassing love. Loving God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. It profits you nothing. And loving your neighbor and loving your brothers as Christ has loved the church. And loving your enemies and doing good unto them. If that love of God is not there, all those ambitions will not get us to heaven. That's why it is seen that ought to top your ambition. Or to top your goal, or to top your desires, or to top your aspirations, is that this holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord, is implanted in you. It's done for you. Because it is only as that is done in you, that the Lord prepares you for heaven. Now, how does he do this? How does he sanctify us? How does he so cleanse us that no stain, no blemish, no spot, no inbred sin, no Adamic nature will have control over your life, will still be there directing you, propelling you, leading you to do the things to do, to say the things to say, to act the way you act, to go to the places you go. How will it so happen that this Adamic nature will be totally taken away, uprooted from your life, uprooted from your heart? How can it happen? It is through Christ. I told you already. And then that leads us to point number two. Is the sacrifice of Christ. The sacrifice of Christ. The sin that helps us. The sin that God so uses. And then the Adamic nature is taken away. The inbred sin is taken away. Is that Christ himself is allowed to do what he wants to do. What he delights to do. And what he has sacrificed and paid the price to do in your life. Look at it. Look at the scriptures and see what Christ himself has said in his prayer. I'm looking at John. John chapter 17. In John chapter 17, here you, you know that John uh, records the prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I've told you already, and I need to tell you again, in this chapter here, Pharisees are not there. In this chapter here, the Sadducees are not there. In this chapter here, Judas is carried is not there. In this chapter here, secret disciples who love the Lord secretly but are ashamed of him to declare him publicly because they are afraid that they will be cast out of the synagogue. All those people are not here. Who are the people that are here in verse 3? Those who have eternal life. 
Who are the people that are here in verse 6? The people that Christ has manifested his word to and they have received the word of the Lord. Who are the people that are here in verse 9? The people that are not of the world, but they have been chosen out of the world. Who are the people that are here? The people that are not backsliders in verse 12. The people that Christ himself has saved and he has kept them. Who are the people that are here? In verse 14, they are the people who are not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. Who are the people that are here? The people that are being kept from the evil that's in the world. In verse 15, who are the people that are here? In verse 16, the people, the practices of the world are not theirs. The pollutions of the world, they are not involved in it. It says they are not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. Who are the people that are here? They are the people who have had the first touch of the Lord, the first transformation of the Lord and the people that have been born again, the people that are saved having their names written in the book of life. And now Christ prays for them. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And then he tells us in verse 19 and for their sakes I sanctify myself. For their sake I set myself apart. For their sakes I make myself a sacrifice. For their sakes I'm going to the cross setting myself apart for death for suffering, for the shedding of my blood, so that they might be sanctified through the truth. It's through the sacrifice of Jesus, through his setting himself apart, through his sacrificing himself, that will become sanctified. You cannot get sanctified just by trial and error, just by resolutions, just by being the best you can. Just by reading the Bible. Just by ordinarily coming to the Congress. You get sanctified when you look up to the cross. And you look up to Jesus Christ who gave everything up on the cross of Calvary. That you might be sanctified. And read that again in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 25. Husbands, love your wives. Even as Christ also loved the church. Christ loved the church. And gave himself for each. The one single thing that Christ has done to show that he loves the church supremely beyond any other love is to give himself for the church so that the church might be sanctified. In verse 26, that he, he, not the denomination, that he, not ideologies, that he, not just uh, the work we do, the service will render, uh, as I render service to the Lord, render service to the Lord, my service will sanctify me, not at all, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself. He knows what he wants, he knows what the end product ought to be, he knows what he's looking for, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy it must be holy it should be holy and then it says not uh, that it should be holy and without blemish in Titus chapter 2 Titus chapter 2 reading there in verse 14 we're looking at the very fact that is a sacrifice of Christ by which we're sanctified it tells us in verse 14 who gave himself is talking about Jesus Christ because in the latter part of verse 13 it talks about our Savior Jesus Christ and then he continues by saying who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works in first John chapter 1 first John chapter 1 verse 7 here it tells us, but he will walk in the light. As he is in the light, we have fellowship with him. That means we are born again already. We are children of God and we are walking in the light. We are walking in the truth. We are walking in the spirit. We are walking according to the commandment of the Lord. We are walking as Christ walked. But that's not the end. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. It's still available. That cleansing, that purifying, that sanctifying by the blood of the Lamb, that's still available and is available waiting for everyone. In Hebrews chapter 9, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience, purge your conscience. 
purge your conscience. If you will be sincere and open to the spirit of God, you will see that something needs to be purged there in your conscience. In, a verse, in a Hebrews chapter 10 verse 10. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. By the which will. The will of God, which is for sanctification, by that will and through the offering of the of Jesus Christ once for all, we're sanctified. And then he tells us, as he moves on in verse 14, for by one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. Them that are sanctified. That's what he wants to do in Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews 13, verse 12, verse 12 says, Wherefore? Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, is suffered without outside the gate. Let us go therefore, let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. When we do that, what's he going to do? Because he wants to sanctify. Because in verse 20 now, the God of peace, who, who brought, that brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd, of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant make you perfect in every good work to do his will walking in you that which is well pleasing in his sight through jesus christ to whom the glory forever and ever and that shows you very clearly what the scripture is telling us that if we're going to be sanctified if we're going to be purified, if we're going to be made holy within and without, through and through, it is through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Now, what will that, how can we get it? Point number three, the supplication of Christ and Christians. The supplication of Christ and Christians. Christ prayed and apostles prayed. And we ourselves, we need to pray so that that sanctification will be ours. In John, we come back to John again. John chapter 17 in verse 9. Here it says, I pray for them. For who? Those who have eternal life. I told you in verse 3. I pray for them. For who? I told you in verse 6. Those that he has manifested the name of the Father to you, and he has given them the word and the world has hated them and they have come to the Lord and they belong to the Father and they belong to Christ. I pray for them. I pray not for the world but for them which thou gavest me for they are thine. What prayer was he praying? It, tells, it shows us the prayer in verse 17. In verse 17, sanctify them, purify them, make them holy, make, and make them totally clean within and without. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. And did he include you in the prayer? Did he include the present church in the prayer? In verse 20, neither prayer for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. And then he tells us when that thing is done, that day in verse 21, that they all may be one. When we're sanctified, there will be unity. When we're sanctified, there will be togetherness. We'll be of one heart. We'll be of one soul. We'll go the same direction. We'll love the same thing. We'll be willing to die for the same thing. We'll be eager, desirous for the same thing. We'll be pulling in the same direction. That's what sanctification does. When we're sanctified, we'll not be torn apart. When we're sanctified, there'll be no discord. When we're torn apart, when we're torn apart, there's no sanctification. When we're divided, there is no sanctification. When we think in opposite directions, there is no sanctification. When somebody is pulling up and I am pulling down, there's no sanctification. When we're going this direction and then I branch off to another direction, there is no sanctification. When we cannot speak with the same voice and go the same direction and think in the same way and map out the same strategy and follow the same Lord and act the same way and be so united, there is no sanctification. When the choir comes to sing before the preacher and the choir, what they are singing, they are ministering separately and it's not in accord with the heart of the one that is to preach. There is no sanctification. When the walkers there, when the cheer sings apart and they go this direction and the pastor, the preacher goes this opposite direction, there is no sanctification. When the preacher hears times and the thing that is a burden on his heart and the thing that is the glory of God that is looking for and exalting, and the preacher is wanting to lift up the glory of God and the congregation is wanting to put it down and tear it apart and crush everything and destroy everything there's no sanctification there sanctification 
brings us together. Sanctification makes us to think the same way and to follow the same path and to go the same direction. Sanctification makes us so united. We want to say the same thing. We want to do the same thing. We want to go the same direction. We want to be united, not only in doctrine, in action, in attitude, in disposition, in planning, in everything that we do. That's sanctification in verse 21, that they all may be one. As the Father, thou Father art in me, and thou in thee. Tell me, was there any time when Christ was in disagreement with the Father? He was not in disagreement. Eh, even though it might be difficult, he went to the Garden of Gethsemane. He said, Father, I'll never disagree with you. I see this cup you want me to drink, and this cup is going to be bitter, and if it be thy will, I'll not want anything that is not your will. If suffering is your will, if Calvary is your will, if the cross is your will, if drinking this cup is your will, not my will, thy will be done. That's sanctification when you're given a difficult assignment. When the church is going a particular direction and you think this is difficult and this is hard. This is like drinking the bitter cup. When we're sanctified, there'll be so much unity. You will not want to do anything. That, no, that thing is hard. That thing is difficult. We're not going to go that direction. It says that they all may be one as our Father art in me and I in thee that they also may be one in us that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. That's what will make the world to believe when the unity is there. That's what will make the world to believe when we are all together one. Listen. When you in your house members of the church you are discussing something that your unbelieving neighbors, they know that you are not in unity with your pastor. Eh, they will not believe in the Lord. When the people around us here, eh, where we're having retreat here, and we're having conferences and congresses here, and they're hearing what we're saying, and they say, ah, that deeper life church, they fight one another. Their pastor throws something at them, and from the comment their pastor is making on the pulpit, they must be throwing something to him too. It's like they're throwing daggers at one another. Another. And all the villages around here, they know they hear, they have information that we're not in total unity. We're not in agreement. They will not believe. They may die in their sins. But when you are one with me, and I am one with you, and the choir is one with all the workers, and there is nothing we're cheering apart, and there is unity that the world may believe that thou hast sent me for the sake of the world out there, for the sake of your unbelieving relatives who are not born again yet, for the sake of the people who are watching us whether we're united or not why don't you forget yourself and come to Christ and be sanctified why don't I forget myself and come to the Lord and be sanctified why don't we as representatives of the church of this deeper life Bible church for the sake of the ignorant people in our congregations that are still there for the sakes of the new converts that are in our churches that are watching how, how are they going to be saved all those people coming to your church when they see that you people there who are preaching in your local church in your village church when you preach you are throwing stones at the headquarters and those people in your church in your local church they know they understand when you speak in proverbs they understand when you speak anything they understand all those people coming to your church who are not born again yet when they see you are divided from the headquarters you are not united with the headquarters how are they going to believe when you invite your mother you invite your father you invite your relatives you invite them to the church and then as they come to the church here i stand wanting to preach and you invited your relatives and you invited your friends and then you do something there that then I stand up and instead of going to the preaching directly, I say, that person, sit down there. I say, that person, why are you, why are you take that person away from there? And the newcomers that come, they see that these people are not united. As they fight in the church in the world, in the local church, secular church, nominal church in the world, so they're also fighting here. We fight. We fight. You know it. I know it. Only that I'm fighting the good fight of faith. But some of you are fighting the bad fight of unbelief. And the people that see us quarrel, the people that see us fight, the people that see us in disagreement, they're not going to get saved. That's the reason why. For the sake of the perishing world, 
For the sake of the people that need to know Christ. That we will be one. As our Father art in me. And I in thee. That the world may believe. That thou hast sent me. If you are of Christ. If you are born again. You will look up here. And whatever comes out of this pulpit will be the final thing that everybody will take and take everywhere. And there will be unity. We will be one together. And there is anything in your heart, anything in your action, we doesn't show that unity. You're one of the people drawing the church back. And those people outside there who should come into the faith, you are the people Barring them, nailing them outside, that they will not come in. And you people, whenever the church corrects you, it's going to be the discussion in your place of work. It's a discussion on the table when you are eating with your little children. Those little children, they'll never get born again. Because they see that you, that family, you are not in unity with the church you are bringing your children to. And all the people that hear you tear things apart. And you see the actions. Those people standing up, can you sit down? All those, uh, all those things that you see, all those things that you do, that shows that you are not one, is going to hinder the people that ought to get saved. That's why here is Congress. I will want this church to be a glorious church. And it's going to take more than preaching. It's going to take you, everyone, to say, today, I surrender. Because if you don't, a lot of things are going to go wrong. As for getting to heaven, for me, <laughs> I'll get there. The concern is just to know whether I can take you there or not. That's just the concern. As, as for getting there, <laughs> I've told the Lord, he needs to break my head, crush me, scatter me, take me away from preaching, hide me somewhere, in the hollow of his hand, just to get to heaven, I'll get there. The concern is that you will have the mind of Christ, will accept the word of God, and when we say, this is what you do, you act as children of God, and accept the word of God, so that you can get to heaven. And so that all the things that are happening, I'm so surprised. You see, those people have to now tell to sit down. Why do I have to do that? If the Spirit of God is controlling them, everybody's sitting down. Why are they standing up? All the cassettes in this Congress were not selling cassettes. Why? You see, I released the choir now. We sang our song. Jesus didn't have orchestra. There was no choir on the day of Pentecost. It's just their privilege to sing if they are in one accord with their pastor. And all of you people there, we, we, don't, we don't get anything done in the church by struggling, by fighting. Struggling, fighting. Rebellion, disobedience, unrighteousness. Those things don't qualify us to have a special place in the sight of God. Doesn't God value holiness and humility? If you know that that's what God values, why do we throw humility and holiness? We throw it away so much and we grab and embrace pride. Why? Didn't you come in to get to heaven? Who brainwashed you? Who has bewitched you? 
You forget why you came. What are you struggling for? The original goal of wanting to get to heaven. Do you still have that goal? Who shall abide in thy holy hill? Who shall dwell in that sanctuary? He that has clean hands and a pure heart. If it were possible, all I can do is to take away this one and take away this. That's all I can do. Only God can take a knife and dissect me like this and look inside and then bring a mirror before me and say, see this thing. That's the thing that will hinder you from getting to heaven. Only God can do that for you. Stand up and let him do it. Let him dissect you. Let him dissect you. Look at your heart. Look at your heart. Look at your heart. And, and see the inbred sin. And see the Adamic nature. And see the rebellion there. And see the disobedience there. And see the sin there that is not of God. And let him open you up. Let him open you up. Let him open you up. Open everything. And see if there is something there. If there is something there that will not allow you to get to heaven. We want to get to heaven. That's why we came here. What else are we looking for? Have you forgotten your purpose of coming? Have you forgotten the reason why you came to this church? Did you come to fight? Did you come to tear us apart? Did you come to destroy? Is it not to get to heaven? This way you are going now. Will you get there? 